let's talk a little bit today about bones and bone structure. First of all, when we want to understand a part of the body, we like to talk about its function and its structure. So if we're going to talk about bones and the skeletal system in general, the first thing I want to do is talk about its functions. So what do your bones do for you? Well, they do a couple of really obvious things. First of all, they provide us with generalized structure. They also provide us with stability. So that's the idea that your bones physically hold you up. So you would be a pile of mush on the floor without bones. And in fact, the way your bones are fit together and hold you up determines a variety of things. For instance, your height, how tall you are, is very strongly related to your bones. And when older adults lose height, a lot of that is related to bone deterioration and deterioration of joints. Your bones are also really important for protection. So they protect some of our most important organs. In particular, your axial, the middle part of you skeleton, is really important for the protection. You've got your skull, which keeps your brain from being smashed by things in case you get hit in the head with something. You've got your ribs, which protect your heart and lungs. And then the other bones that are protective a little bit, they're also related to the joints, but your pelvic area has some fairly strong bones, so it's some pretty good protection. And so got to protect those reproductive organs since biology wants to reproduce. So if those are your protective bones in the middle or axial part of the skeleton, what about the outside parts? Well, they are mostly for movements. Your axial skeleton is all about, or your appendicular skeleton is all about moving around the appendages. So movement is, you need bones for movement to work well, but they're not the only thing involved in movement. They work together with the muscles to make movement happen. But if you don't have the bone to pull on, the sort of lever to move, again, you're going to have essentially mush just dragging itself forward and it's very inefficient movements. Your bones are important for movement. Your bones then have two more important jobs that sometimes get forgotten. Well, one of them is related to the stuff in the middle of the bone, and that is the bone marrow. And one of the big things the bone marrow does is it produces blood cells. So all of your baby blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, even platelets, all come from the bone marrow. So your bone marrow actually plays a key role in things like your immune system and your circulation, even though you don't think of your bones as being part of that. And then finally, the last role that your bones play function-wise is related to what they're made out of. So when we say bones, what do we think? Well, bones are made of calcium and other minerals. And in fact, bones are for mineral storage. So when your body has minerals, it can stick them on your bones. And if your body needs minerals and they're not currently in circulation, it can grab them off your bones. And in fact, your body would rather grab them off your bones than anything else. So when we think about, for example, taking calcium to improve our bones, we actually need calcium for a lot of other things. It is used in muscle contraction. It is used in nerve signaling. It is used all over the place. And if you need it for those things, they're actually more important than your bones. So if you eat enough calcium and it's in your bloodstream, then you can use that for your nerves. But if you don't and you suddenly need calcium, your body is going to go take it off of your bones first. It considers the nervous system more important than the skeletal system. And then you have to convince it to put that calcium back on your bones. And there are ways to do that and hormones that control that. I'll discuss that in a whole different setting. But it's important to note that your bones are mineral storage and that your body will use those minerals if needed. All right. So that's the function part of bones. Now let's talk a little bit about the structure part of bones. Bones don't start out as bone. That's the most interesting thing about them is that the starting point of a bone is actually cartilage. So how is that different from bone? Well, both of them are very similar in that they both have cells and a matrix. So if we're talking about cartilage, we might have some little cells and these cells produce some proteins 
And because they produce the proteins, the proteins are actually kind of all around them. And that's the matrix of the cartilage is all the stuff around these little cells. And in the case of cartilage, that protein is mostly soft. It is a jelly-like substance that the cells are in. And that's the starting point. So first, you create the base of the bone, which is the jelly-like substance with the cells that are there. And those cells, being that they are part of cartilage, are called chondrocytes or chondroblasts, because you might recall that blast cells help produce something. So the cells that are helping to actively produce new cartilage matrix, new proteins, are chondroblasts. So now, if we want to turn the cartilage into bone, what do we need to do? Well, one, we need to add bone cells, and two, we need to take that squishy protein and add minerals to it. So the mineralization of cartilage is what makes bone. So now let's think about what we're gonna talk about with bone cells. Well, we know a cell is typically ends in sight. Bone typically comes with the word osteo. So osteocytes are bone cells. There are two types, osteoblasts, just like the chondroblasts help to create bone matrix. In this case, they help produce the mineral substance or add minerals to the protein. But as I said a moment ago, bones are also mineral storage, which means those, those minerals can be removed. And osteoclasts remove the minerals. These words are very close together. So if you are trying to answer questions related to them, you gotta be careful. Osteoblasts build bone. Osteoclasts dissolve or destroy bone. All right, so if you have the cartilage, that's your starting point, then you might get the bone cells to come on in. So I'm gonna grab the bone cells and they are going to be the osteoblasts, which will go ahead and boom, start to produce the minerals. Once they produce the minerals, now they start to harden everything up around them and the stuff around them can turn into bone structure. So when embryos and fetuses are developing in the uterus, they start with cartilage and over the period of development, the osteoblasts come in, they turn most of that bone, that cartilage into the bones that become what they are. Now once bones are set with the minerals, they don't change a whole lot. They can increase a little bit and decrease a little bit. So most of them also still have to maintain a bunch of cartilage as children to get to the point where they will become adults. In the case of babies, we're actually very familiar with this because it happens in the skull. So the bones of the skull mostly form, but actually leave a whole bunch of cartilage around the edges where they're not quite formed so that the head is not completely solid and it can squish a little bit to pass through the mother's pelvis, then those bones, the cartilage sections, will mineralize afterward, forming the complete bone. Children also have growth plates in their bones. So if I were to draw a bone, vump, classic long bone, there are spots in the bone where there's actually still cartilage, both on the top and sort of the bottom, where that bone can get longer on either end to help for a growing child. So you still need cartilage to grow bone. There are some areas of cartilage in your body that actually never mineralize and become bone. They are usually on the ends of bones, so the ends keep the cartilage. They still have something squishy to run into. Then there's areas that you're familiar with, like the tip of your nose, which is still squishy cartilage, and your ears. So the top portion of your ears is still cartilage. It's just firm enough to form a substance, but just squishy enough that you can poke something through it, for example, if you were going to pierce that. It is much harder to poke something through an actual bone, and when people need to get pins in their bones to hold things together, they typically have to be drilled and done under surgery. So you do have squishy cartilage in other parts of your body that never mineralizes, but all of your bones started as cartilage 
and they became mineralized. That also relates to how they reform when you injure them and put them back together. They always have cartilage first and then the osteocytes and blasts come in later. All right, so that's some basics of bone stuff. Now I want to show you how this bone here, this long bone that I drew, would actually be put together from a sort of top-down view. So let's say we actually cut this bone right across here and we could look down on it. I'm going to show you how these bone cells get structured in the minerals. All right, so first of all, when we talk about bone cell structures, we are typically talking about a large scale structure called an osteon or a haversion system, which is the system in which the bone cells are set up within the minerals so that they can receive what they need and help the bone stay active. Bones are shockingly active parts of the body. They seem like they are actually the most like dead parts of your body, but no, the bone cells are actually consistently active. And that means they need a consistent nutrient source and consistent oxygen, and both of those things come from blood vessels. So the starting point of our osteon or our reversion system would be our blood vessels. So there's my artery and there's my vein, and they kind of sit in the middle of the minerals, but they're not squished by the minerals. So the minerals are right near them, but not too far. These act an awful lot like a reservoir in that they need to feed their nutrients out to all of the little houses in the area, which are like the osteocytes. And so a reservoir has to provide water to a town. We aren't all floating houses on water, so we don't have water all the time. We need to get it from somewhere. So how do we do that? Well, if we think about it this way with this sort of metaphor, then this is my reservoir in the middle with the artery and vein. And out here are going to be my little osteocyte houses. So osteocytes are living, boom, surrounding it, but not too, too close, because they each need to be producing their own minerals to help this aversion system exist. So they're out here being active and producing minerals, but they still need the nutrients coming from the arteries and veins. All right, so. These guys are the osteocytes. They could be osteoclasts, they could be osteoblasts. In the middle, we have what we would call the central canal, because that's the canal in the center. And now we need to talk about these guys. So first of all, everything sits in a whole bunch of minerals. So there's minerals surrounding all of this. And I'm not gonna draw that because then it would be a mess. But the minerals surrounding it has a really interesting name. It is hydroxyapatite, which if you break that word down, I love the Latin roots of words. Hydroxy, hydrogen, oxygen. So it's hydroxinated, they have OHs on them. Apatite is essentially a Latin -y way of saying rocks. So these are mineral-based hydrolyzed rock pieces. And that's, you know, from a chemical standpoint, it describes what they are. But you can think of it like literally having houses in the soil. So bones are like soil. They're a little bit annoying to dig up and move around. When you place a house in a soil, in fact, typically it has a little bit of its own property surrounding it. And in fact, bones do the same thing. The osteocytes each have a little bit of space around them so that they are not bumping right up next to the minerals and it allows the stuff from the central canal to eventually get into them. And each of those little spaces surrounding the osteocytes is called a lacunae. So the lacunae is the little bit of space that surrounds the osteocyte. All right, so now, now we need to make the connections between the central canal and the osteocytes. And how do we do that? Well, if it is like a reservoir sending water, we would be sending little pipelines. In fact, that's about right, is that in this mineral substance, there are these tiny little pipelines or itty bitty canals, because this is the central canal, that help to connect all of these things. And in fact, 
the name for these itty bitty canals is a Latin word that essentially means itty bitty canals, and it is canaliculi, canaliculi. So the canaliculi are these tiny little, they look like cracks under the microscope, pieces that connect the osteocytes. They tend to go in these sort of concentric circles. So when you look at them, they're not perfect, but they tend to branch out in circles. And each of the concentric circles is called a lamellae. And that's just another Latin word for describing what things look like. I'm only gonna draw one of the circles here, but they branch out just like if you're looking at rings of a tree. So if you look at bone tissue under a microscope, it actually looks like a bunch of trees stuck together, which is kind of cool. The nutrients and the oxygen come from the central canal, it goes out through the little canaliculi to the osteocytes. It can float around them in the lacunae, use it to water their lawns. And it also sends the waste products, just like your sewage, back so it can go down into the vein. And so your bone has this active blood flow and active cells and active stuff running through it all the time, which is really cool. It's also how it's able to fix itself if you break it. All right, that is our introduction to bones, structure, and function.